Welcome. It's really good to see everybody here, and uh, it's good to see your faces. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. As we, uh, yeah, as Monica said, as we keep moving through our, our different rhythms, different rhythms that bring us life, that help us to connect with Jesus in the midst of um, all the craziness that life ensues. And so tonight we get to pick up on the awesome theme of baptism. And if I'm honest, I think baptism is one of those things that is quite um, confusing nowadays. Uh, when I was doing research for this, I was looking through all these different books and all these different websites, and I did this thing where I stalked other church websites to see what they said about baptism, because I thought I could just steal all my good, off, good ideas off of them. Um, but it didn't quite work that way, because nine times out of ten, when I went to these different sites, and they all start with this big question of why baptism, they all started off with this one phrase that to me just seemed odd. That, one, that number one phrase that they kept on saying over and over and over again was, because Jesus instructed us to do it, so we need to be obedient. Which sounds like really good and spiritual at first, doesn't it? But when you think about it a little bit, if the only reason, if the primary reason we're doing something in faith is just because Jesus told us to do it, do you think maybe we're missing something about the value of it? Like we could have said last week, oh, we're doing communion because Jesus said, remember me, so do it. But we'd miss such a, a huge aspect you know, we could say, yeah, we could pray because Jesus told us to, um, so you probably should, should do that. And often baptism is that same way. People are like, you should get baptized. Why? Uh, Jesus uh, told us to. Then it's a good thing. You can invite some friends and family along. You get dunked. It's a nice family event, and you have food afterwards. Usually it becomes the sum conversation around baptism. Um, and I just want to see if we can expand that conversation, because if we just start with we do it because we should, we're missing, I think, a huge element and the value of it. But the truth is, I think baptism, we find it complicated because we don't even know why we do it. And throughout history, it's changed heaps of times. So um, in the earliest Christian history, we've got some accounts of like there's this Ethiopian guy who was traveling and he was reading these scriptures and one of the disciples, Philip, came and this guy was reading a passage in Isaiah that was talking just about Jesus. And Philip's like, hey, what are you reading? And he's like, oh, I don't know. I don't really understand. And Philip's like, what's the verse? And it was all about Jesus. And Philip's like, oh, well, it's about Jesus. So he tells him about Jesus. And this man was like, well, this is amazing. There's some water. Shouldn't I be baptized now? So Philip says, well, I guess so, and goes over and the Ethiopian gets dunked there and then. And as a little side note, whenever I read the story, I get frustrated because I have yet to have an evangelism encounter where someone asks me, what must I do to be saved? I think Philip got off so easy. This guy was like, how do I get to know Jesus? It hasn't happened that way for me yet, um, but maybe it happens that way for you. So it started off baptism. You just, as soon as you believed in faith, you were baptized there and then. But then uh, what happened was in the early church, you had this huge influx of all these different people from all these different walks of life. And so what happened was you get all these people baptized, but then they didn't really know any of the core tenets of faith. And they often went back to worshiping at the temples and to offering food to idols. And the early church was like, no, no, you can't, you can't do that. You've been baptized. It's a new way of life now. But they didn't get that. So the early church instituted this thing called the catechism, which was like a three-year discipleship program that a new convert would kind of go through they do this three-year discipleship program, and then they'd get baptized. And that became the modern way, that became the way of doing baptism. But then it changed, and people began to realize, oh, baptism's really special. That must be where your sins get forgiven, because, you know, you're, you die, and then you come up again, and you're a forgiven person. So the baptism must be the forgiven point. Well, then what happens when you sin after baptism? And they got all nervous. And so then it was understood that baptism was like the magic bullet, the sin cure. So they d ended up delaying baptism as long as humanly possible until they're on their deathbed, like lying there croaking, and they'd sit there ready with some water to like take them over, dunk them, and then put them back in bed. Which to me is an incredibly stressful event. Like you're already dying, and you've also got your eternal salvation at stake based upon like it's this constant judge game, like I wanna get baptized, but if I go too soon, I'm likely to have a dirty thought and sin and go to hell. But if I go too late, then I won't get baptized in time and I'll die like in the water. So is this, I reckon, an incredibly stressful event for people getting baptized. So you ended up delaying baptism, baptism until the very, very, very last minute because that was the way it was done. And then in the Middle Ages, uh, baptism changed again. Um, churches ended up becoming like a really central part of society and they ended up owning all of the burial grounds. And so if you wanted to be buried, 
you had to be a member of the church. And to be a member of the church, you had to have been baptized. And that posed a real problem for little children, particularly for, for infants, um, particularly because the infant mortality rate would have been incredibly high at the time. And all these mothers would want to make sure that their children could make it into the new creation, you know, could make it into heaven and be with Jesus. So they started, they shift baptism and they moved it earlier and earlier so that as soon as you were born, you were baptized. So in case your child didn't survive, they could be buried in the church's land as opposed to just being left out. Um, so baptism then became a really early thing. And then it changed again. Um, throughout the, uh, the Reformation happened. Um, I don't know if you know much about church history, but you had like the Catholics and then all these Protestants are like, hey, you're too legalistic. So they all broke off and started their own thing. And then all these Protestants kind of wanted to get rid of a lot of the rituals that the Catholics had. And then they ended up, faith became really cerebral. It became about having right belief. Like you needed to think the right thoughts about Jesus in order to be a Christian. You needed to rationally believe that Jesus was your Lord and Savior. And this phenomenon came upon the church in around the 1800s, which still lasts today. And that baptism got moved back. And the main point of becoming Christian was transferred to a prayer. And now it's a prayer, my guess is that mostly, most of you were probably very familiar with. It's called the sinner's prayer. Um, most of us, if, you're, if you grew up in a Christian family, you probably prayed that prayer around the age of five. Um, and when you shared your testimony at youth group, your, your testimony was, well, I was into sex, drugs, and rock and roll until I prayed the prayer at five years old, and then I became a Christian. Um, but it was this amazing thing. In the 1800s, they started having all these big uh, meetings, these huge revival meetings where thousands and thousands of people would come. And it was impractical to try and baptize everyone then. And plus, baptism was seen as kind of weird and ritualistic. And we were all about relationship and right belief. And so these ministers, these preachers began saying, if you want to become a Christian, then come to the front and pray this prayer with me. And it goes something like, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Please give me the gift of eternal life. Amen. Right? Most of us are probably relatively familiar with this prayer. And it's a great prayer, and it's done amazing things for thousands and probably millions of people. But what the problem was is now you've got this prayer, which has become your entry point into Christianity, and then you've got baptism over here on this side, and it's often really hard to reconcile the two. When, when did you become a Christian? Was it when you prayed the prayer or... Is it when you were baptized? And most of us would be like, oh, I, want to be I became a Christian when I prayed that prayer. Well, then what was the point of baptism? Because uh, Jesus told me to do it. You know, and I think we miss some of the huge significances of baptism if we just understand it as something that we're meant to do. And if everything is placed on this one prayer that we pray at the beginning, then we miss the significance of what baptism could be. So tonight, we're just going to explore baptism a little bit. And we're going to look at particularly two different dimensions of what baptism does within our lives. So the first thing is baptism, it talks about a change of relationship in like a vertical direction between you and God. And I think the best way to explain this is to explain kind of some of the Jewish ideas about baptism. Because baptism was a Jewish thing before it was a Christian thing. And there's this one wonderful guy named John the Baptist who started calling all these people in Israel in the time to repentance. And so they would come to this Jordan River, and they would walk through the waters. And this baptism had these two really significant things. One, it was to become ritually clean. It was like a ritual washing so you could go and worship at the temple. But it also had this amazing, significant story behind it, is that it, ex it echoed this theme of the Exodus. Now, we talked a little bit about the Exodus um, last week, and we're just going to mention it again this week. The Exodus was arguably the most amazing, uh, pivotal, key story that defined the Jewish people. Like, if you were to define what makes you, you, what makes a Jewish person a Jew, they would look back to the story of the Exodus. And the Exodus had these really key themes. The first one is that they started off as slaves in Egypt, under oppression, and they would work hours and hours and hours every day for this oppressive pharaoh who paid them nothing, who slaughtered their children, 
And they lived under this groan of slavery for years and years until they cried out, Lord, do something. For 400 years, we've been breaking our backs for this man and we are dying. Lord, save us. And then there's this amazing thing where God hears their cry. This people who, has a, who have no power to save themselves, God hears them and he sends Moses. And through Moses, he does these mighty works, the 10 these 10 plagues that just totally um, flip Egypt on its head. And everything Egypt thought was powerful no longer was, and God was proven to be the most powerful, and God begins to lead his people out of Egypt. And there's this pivotal moment where they've left Egypt and they come to the banks of the Red Sea. And it's so important to understand this, because if you read scripture, this moment, this theme shows up all the time. On the banks of the Red Sea, They're hemmed in as Pharaoh's army approaches them and there's water in front. It's going to be a bloodbath because there's nowhere to go. When God parts the waters and this people move through it, this whole nation goes through the water. And when they come up the other side, the water closes behind them and the army is defeated, decimated, gone. There is no one pursuing them, no one chasing them. When this nation of Israel went, started on one side of the Red Sea, they started off as slaves. And as they made their way through, when they got to the other side, they were a free people. And it's amazing. It took them so long to understand it. You see it later in their wanderings in the desert time and time again. You can see how long it took for their mindset to change that they were no longer slaves in Egypt because they kept on saying, can't we just go back? This is hard. This is difficult. I just want to go back to Egypt. At least there we were fed. At least there people told us what to do. At least there I felt safe because I knew who I was. But again, God kept on saying, no, you are a new people. And he gathered them around this mountain and he gave them the law and he redefined them. Israel, you will be my people and I will be your God. The story from slavery through the waters to freedom and a new people. And so when we look at baptism for us, I want us to pick up on the same theme, and I think this is what Paul does when he looks at it. Paul, when writing to the Romans, says, or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we've been united with him in death like his, we will certainly also be reunited with him in a resurrection like his. What Paul does is this clever thing is he he carries over these echoes. Remember how Israel started off as slaves, went through the water, and became a new people. You and me were the same. When we start off here, we are all slaves and slaves to sin. And I want to have a little discussion about this, because again, I grew up in a Christian family, and so I heard um, my dad and all these other ministers constantly preaching about sin. And one of the things that I always understood sin to be is, oh, it's a bad thing that you do. Stop doing the bad thing, and then you can stop sinning, and then you'll be fine. Sin was like a black mark that went on you, and Jesus would just basically get the black marks off of you. But I think sin is so much better understood like slavery. Because sin is the state that, we were, that we're stuck in. You know, it's, you can't free yourself from sin. Sin is like this downward circle. Um, it's like addicts. When they start on one drug, they only need a little. But as they continue, they need more and more and more and more to get the same high. It's the same way for us. When we lie, it starts off with one lie. But then one lie seems to work itself in, into another and to another and to another, and to another, and to another, until we're so bogged down, we have no way to get out. The same way, same way works with pornography as we look at it. It starts off with simple things are enough to satisfy us, but then that doesn't cut it, and we have to look at more, and we have to consume more, and we have to consume more, and it has to become more weird and more violent just to give us that same high, that same push, that same plug. And sin is that same way. It's this state of slavery, this downward spiral, this downward circle out of which there is no way that we can help ourselves. There's no way we can say, yep, I've got this. I'll just stop sinning tomorrow. 
Got this, guys. It's a state of slavery that we were in. But what Paul does is he says, look, we started off as slaves, but it's amazing because as we pass through these waters, just like Israel passed through the Red Sea, so also we pass through with Jesus through his death and his resurrection. When we go down in baptism, you put yourself down and it's like you died. That slave who came out of Egypt was put to death. That person that you were then is gone. And when you are raised, you're raised up as a new person, a new creation, um, part of what, God, what we call God's new humanity. A new people that he's using to create and change the entire world. And this is, this is the beginning of this vertical relationship with Jesus. As you go through baptism, it's down through the waters and you died. And then through the death and resurrection, you're raised to new life. And the beauty of it is that you didn't have to fix yourself. You don't have to try and be better. You don't have to try and make yourself better for God or for anyone else. This is what God is doing in you. Because we were slaves, but God has brought us out through the waters and has raised us into new life. And baptism, one of the cool things that I like about this is baptism embodies all this in a really very physical way. Um, particularly in Western Christianity, we have this really bad habit. And I mentioned at the beginning is we have this thing where Christianity is something that we need to think. You know, we hear those verses all the time, believe in Jesus. Oh, okay. You know, believe in what he's done for you. And what we translate that to is, okay, rationally, I need to accept that that is a truth. And then that's it. And we assume that's enough for us. Yeah, sure, I prayed a prayer and I believe that Jesus is my savior and that's enough. But the truth is the claim of the gospel is so much bigger. It's not just on our minds, it's on our bodies. It's on our actions. It's on every, it encompasses every bit of who we are. Monica, a few weeks preached ago and said, there is no part of you over which God does not claim lordship. And so the coolest thing is that when we go into baptism, there's this affirmation that this incorporates all of who you are. Not just your mind, not just so you can say the right answers, but everything about you is now changed and is now different. I love that. So where does this leave us? You've got this sinner's prayer, and then you've got this baptism. And how do we reconcile these two? For many of us, I think the sinner's prayer is like our entryway into faith. It's a great way to start off and say, look, I'm not sure about God. I'm not sure about Jesus. I'm not sure about any of this, but I know I need help, and I know I need to do something, and I know I need to respond somehow. So we have this prayer, and it's amazing, and it works for this entry point into your life. But what I think baptism is, is it's going beyond the entry point. It's no longer around the fringes. It's you saying, this is me, all in, 100%. This is my life now. I'm going to be dead to who I was, and I'm now going to be a new person in Jesus. We have this, I have this phrase that I really think works well for church, and I, think we hope, I hope it applies for us here, is that Christianity, I think, is a place that should be porous around the edges and solid at the core. And so for those who are around the edges and around the fringes, pray these prayers. Say, God, come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Help me walk this new journey. Stay around those porous edges. Get used to the story. Get used to some of the rhythms and the ways that we are. But at some point, I hope each and every one of us will move eventually from these porous edges to this solid core, where Christianity is no longer just a if and maybe thing, no longer just a rational thought thing, no longer just a, yeah, maybe this might work for me thing, to a, this is all I am now. This redefines my life. Who I was before is not who I am now. And that's what baptism is. It's this fundamental statement that says, vertically, my relationship with God is completely different from what it was. Now, I want to talk about one other uh, element and one other um, 
dimension to baptism, and I think this is one of the least stated ones ever, is that there's this horizontal element to baptism. Now, I don't know about you, but I have a love-hate relationship with people um, in general. Maybe it's, maybe it's just me. You guys all are holy and love everyone you meet. Um, but I'm at that stage of life where, you know, I'll get a call to be like, hey, let's go hang out. And I, ha- I seriously weigh up. I could go see that person or I could just sit on my couch and watch Netflix. And there's a serious dilemma uh, for me in that. And for us, when we enter church, I think we've got this, we all have our own mixed relationships with people, you know? And for some of us, when we come to church, it's awesome. Some of our best friends are here. And that's how it was for me as a kid. When I came to church, some of my best friends were people I met at church. But at the same time, when I came to church, there were a few people I tried really hard to avoid. And there's this one person, at least in the churches in Mexico, there was this one person I always tried hard to avoid, but every church had one. And this woman was impossible to avoid. It was this older woman who was quite large and who was quite of a hugger. Um, Even if you didn't know her, she was super huggy. You know, and you would try, I would try to avoid her every time you'd walk in and she's always greeting and you're like, oh no. So you like try to like work your way on the other side of your family walking in, but she still finds a way to come over and hug you. And then this lady, she'd always hug me and she always, always wore the vanilla perfume. (sighs) Now, I'm sorry, if there are ladies here wearing vanilla perfume, I don't mean to offend you, but maybe you need to uh, reorder your life decisions. Um... (laughs) They always had that vanilla perfume, and now to this day I smell vanilla, and you get like this shiver down my spine, like, oh, no. I can't do it. I can't do it. You know, and relationships in the church are complicated, and for you, it's probably that, that way. For some of, for some of you, you've, the reason you're at church is because some of the friends you've made here, particularly for our youth and our youth groups. The main thing that keeps them coming week after week are the meaningful, awesome relationships that they develop in church which is great, and that's how it should be. But also for so many of us, and for so many people out there who don't want to be in church, the main reason that they don't ever want to come back is because of relationships with others. They've been burned by someone. They shared something in confidence, and that person used it against them and shared it around as gossip, and they suddenly felt ostracized and judged by a community. Um, You found a preacher that you thought was awesome or a church leader that you thought was the greatest and then something went down and you felt abused by them and then those people never end up coming back to church. And so our relationships with one another is super complicated. And for those who've been wounded by church, it often serves as this amazing reason for which they'll never come back. And you'll hear this super common phrase, which is, oh, I'm totally a Christian. I just don't go to church. And that's My generation, that's our MO, unfortunately. So many of my friends would all say, yep, I love Jesus. I have a radical, you know, real faith in Jesus, and I read my Bible, but I just don't go to church because I can't stand the people. Do you know anyone like that? Maybe it's just me. But for so many of us, it becomes ostracized, and we have this faith system. And again, if all we know of faith in Christianity is, Jesus, would you forgive me of my sins so I can go to heaven— You can do that. You can believe in that and never have to meet another Christian in your life. But baptism reorders that and says that doesn't, that's not how it works. And that's not how the gospel affects us. When we are baptized, we're not just baptized into a new relationship with God, we're baptized into a new relationship with his family. Paul again writes saying, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. And now there's neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And again, I mentioned it a little bit last week, but within the early church, there was just this radical nature of relationships in them. When they would gather to eat, the rich would sit next to the poor who would sit next to the slave, who would sit next to the free, who would sit next to the soldier, who would sit next to the tax collector as they gathered around one meal and became one family. And they were radically hospitable. The stranger was welcomed in. The widow had children to look after and she was welcomed into a new family. The orphans were brought in and had parents and aunties and uncles because really when they were baptized, they recognized that we now have a new family. Family. 
And when I was baptized, I wasn't just baptized for myself. I was baptized into a church community. And as Baptists, this is one of our huge, huge focuses. I won't go into it too much because if I talked about baptism and church governance in one sermon, I'd never be invited back to talk about anything ever again. Um, So I won't go into it, but here in Baptist churches, we've got the strong view of when you're baptized, you're also welcomed into church membership. And church membership is about so much more than just getting to vote for who the new pastor is in a few months' time. Church membership is a statement that says, you are my family, and I'm committing to walk with you. It's this promise that says, I'm going to invest myself here. I'm going to take what I have, my gifts, my abilities, whether that's being able to sing, whether that's able to play music, whether that's being able to cook, whether that's being able to welcome people in the door, whether that's being able to do accounting, whether that's being able to do building, whatever I am, I'm going to bring my gifts and help them here. And it also means that I'm going to ask for help when I'm in needy, when I need something, when I need prayer. I'm going to come to my church community and say, would you stand with me? It's this promise that says, I'm going to speak into the life of this community. I'm going to speak into your lives because now we're family. I was baptized and I'm a member here. You and me are now family. We're not strangers anymore. You and me are not acquaintances. We're family. And so I'm going to speak into your life and I want you to speak into my life. Again, another one of my generation's favorite um, rallying cries after YOLO. Thankfully, that's over. Um, Another rallying cry that we often have is, only God can judge me. But that's not how it works. When we're baptized into a family, you're saying, please speak into my life because I can't walk this journey alone. Because there's so many things in my life that I can't see. I think I'm doing great. You're the one who's going to be able to help me see that I'm maybe not as hot as I thought I was. But you're also going to be able to be the one who can encourage me when I think I'm worse than I am. It's this promise of relationship. And when we're baptized, our relationship with God doesn't just change. But our relationship with each other now changes. And it's this commitment. I'm going to journey with God, and I'm going to journey with you because I'm a new creation and part of a new family. Through baptism, you have a new life and a new family. That's why we get baptized. It's not because we're just trying to be obedient to Jesus. It's not because we're just trying to fulfill the requirements. It's a place for when you have decided, this is me now. God is doing something amazing in my life and he is setting me free and my life is going to be for him. I'm going to get baptized. I'm going to be a part of a church family. I'm going to be part of a community and I'm going to journey with them. When the rest of my society is becoming more and more individualistic, I'm going to connect myself more and more. I'm going to be placed and anchored here because this is my family and this is my new life. If I can ask the musicians to come up, We're just going to come to a close. So where where are you at? For a lot of you who have been baptized, um, it might just be a thing that happened a long time ago that you did because you were meant to do it or because it seemed like the cool thing to do it. To you, I want to say what you did is so much more significant than just a rite of passage. You really are a new person. Jesus really is working in your life. The sins that you still are working through, God is working through with you. And if you feel alone or isolated, remember you are not just baptized by yourself, but you're baptized into a family. And so those of us around you, the person in front of you and the person behind you, is here to help you, is here to pray for you, and is here to be with you. And for those of you who haven't been baptized, what has God been saying to you? What has your journey of faith been like? Have you been around these porous edges for a while? And is maybe God calling you deeper in? To go beyond just a casual, I'm just kind of one foot in, one foot out, debating what I'm thinking. Is God calling you to come in 
and pass through the waters. Come from death into life, from an old family into a new radical family. Just have one exercise that we're going to do as the musicians play. In the center here, we've got some bowls of water. And I want to encourage us all to try something tonight. Um, whenever you're ready, can I encourage you to make your way and just wash your hands in the water as like a taster of what baptism is. For those of you who were baptized, dip your hands in and remember your baptism. Remember what God did in you. Remember who you were before and remember who you are now and how God has taken you on this incredible journey. Wash your hands, let the cold water run through your fingers and remember when you were dipped under. Remember your family and your friends who were there and remember a God who is faithful, a God who is present with you. And even though there are difficulties that you face and even though we run through guilt and we still do so many things wrong, there's a God who loves you so much, a God who heard your cry a long time ago and who has worked to bring you through. Come to the table and wash your hands if you haven't been baptized. Wash your hands and reflect. What is God speaking to me? What is God calling me to do? Maybe this is a chance for you to reflect. Maybe it's my time. Not because I have to, not because Jesus told me to, but because I want to be a new creation and part of a new family and what God is doing this, in this huge, big world. So I'm going to pray, and whenever you're ready, make your way through. Take as long or as short of a time as you like, but just run your hands through the water and allow God to speak to you in this moment. Jesus, we come from so many different um, places and so many different walks of life. And all of us in this room are at a different stage in our journey with you. Some of us are, have, are a long way down the road. We were baptized years ago and we've been walking faithfully. Lord, would you speak to us tonight? Would you help us to remember the amazing things that you've done and how profoundly you have changed us by bringing us from death into life and into your family? And Lord, for those who are still beginning this journey, would you speak to them? Not with condemnation, not with judgment, but with love. The way Christ calls each and every one of us, would you speak to them with that call of love? Would you surround them with your spirit? And would you draw them unto you? We thank you for who you are, Jesus, and for what you've done and for how you made a way for us to become new people through you. Would you give us the grace to continue to walk?